two, three minutes. Okay, great. Um, all right, everybody, uh, welcome to uh, the last Cornell City Financial Data Science Seminar of the year, um, of the year 2020. Of course, uh, this year has been a big year uh, with two big news, one, the US election, the other, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, so I have a few announcements on both sides. First, you'll find that in our little chat room, uh, I've included a link to an article that, um, that uh, describes uh, a competition that a team of our Cornell financial engineering students have won this uh, student competition. And the topic of the competition was, uh, you know, uh, the, the prediction of uh, essentially constructing portfolios of, that will do well under Democrat and Republican wins, which interestingly, after the results of the election came out, uh, the students reran um, re -ran their models, which involve uh, looking at prediction markets. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I recommend uh, reading the, the little blurb we have. Um, and, um, and the second piece of news, of course, uh, in the context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm very happy to have Paul Besson uh, give us a little uh, replay of this year from the perspective of uh, the, uh, the liquidity and the market microstructure. So uh, Paul Besson is a, a colleague of mine and uh, he's a head of quant research at Euronext and I've known him for several years. Uh, one of, uh, he's often at academic conferences presenting papers but, um, but you know, also one foot in the, uh, in the finance world. In other words, he's been working for a broker um, and, uh, and essentially very uh, active in the research community. So he's, in, he's currently in uh, Paris, is that right? So yes. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that we can sort of cross the Atlantic, uh, you know, through this uh, seminar. And anyways, he's one of my favorite speaker at conferences and in fact has this year kept very busy. He has uh, sort of published a uh, course, um, an online course on market microstructure. And again, if you go in the chat room, you'll find the link uh, to that as well as um, his LinkedIn profile. So, you know, this summer we had a, an interesting, uh, we had a little survey of, um, of the seminar attendees and uh, you know, asked for what topics interest you. And among the list of topics, we had market microstructure and we had COVID-19. So I'm very glad to have Paul hit both of these topics uh, today. So uh, Paul, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Sasha. Thanks, Rosel. Thanks for inviting me and thank you, Cornel. And thank you all for attending uh, this presentation today. Okay, so in this presentation, uh, the European liquidity and trading flows during the COVID-19, we will look at how this uh, health crisis changed market liquidity. We will also review the changes that took place within the order books. In particular, we will look at bid ask spreads and available sizes on the first limit. In this presentation, we'll often refer to three main European markets, France, Belgium, and Netherlands, which are the three biggest in the six that manages uh, Euronext. Lastly, in this lecture, our goal will not only be to, to describe what happened uh, and how European liquidity was modified during the COVID crisis, but also to put this into perspective as far as looking as back as the great financial crisis. And to do this, I've extracted some examples from the MOOC I authored <laughs> this year so that you can see how these uh, changes relate to previous changes. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the program. So before we start, we can just say a few words regarding Euronext, not specially because it's my firm, but also to describe the data which, uh, that we will study. So Euronext is now the largest European uh, exchange. We have uh, six markets. We've got uh, Portugal in dark green, Portugal, uh, France, uh, here in Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Ireland, Oslo, uh, the Norway, and uh, in two months, three months time, we get also Italy as well that we've just acquired. Okay, so we have roughly 25% of the stock 600 and 
we will say like more than 10 billion a day in euros that is trading every day on our European stocks. Okay, and that is a data set we will present you and to see which flows and how flows behave during this year in uh, these European countries. Um, that's it for your next. Now I'm going to skip this uh, slide because it's just the history of this uh, Federation of uh, European Exchanges. And now we get to the core of the first part of the presentation. So just as a recap here, we will first look at the timeline because as you know, COVID crisis was different in Europe, in the US and in other parts of the world. Then we'll review the market performance. We'll split this year in four phases, okay? And we study what we will study what happened in each of these phases. So first, the COVID timeline. Okay, so the COVID timeline in Europe. Uh, here we have like four phases. So the first phases we have like the here the large increase in uh, the new cases. Uh, okay, between the 18th of February and 18th of March. Here we describe the main European countries that cover Euronext. Okay, so we see all these countries showing a very high correlation in the COVID crisis uh, cases with this large increase. During this period, it is where you, we observe the largest market drop in Europe. Okay, then you have a second phase where the new cases recede, okay, after a huge confinement was put in place. Uh, this is the second phase and it coincides also with the uh, recovery of the market as you will see in the, for, in the future slide. Then there is a third phase, which we call a plateau, because in that phase, market performance was relatively steady, okay? Even if we saw an increase in the, the second wave that was coming. And then at the end of uh, October, we had like this phase that was really threatening, harsh confinement that was put in place in first in Ireland, then in France also, in, uh, in uh, Be Belgium, Netherlands, uh, apart from Italy, and uh, the fourth phase, which starts at the end of October until now, where we had a recovery in terms of market performance, and also a first decline here in new COVID crisis, in new COVID cases, as you can see, first in Ireland when they confined first, then also in Netherlands, Belgium, and France, who confined slightly uh, later. Okay, that is for the COVID timeline. Now, market, market performances. So for market performances, here we have represented three main markets that we described with our main indices. So CAC 40 for France, Bell 20, the top 20 uh, Belgium stocks, AX, the largest uh, here Dutch stocks. And what you see is that during the first phase, there was a huge drop, but I would say rather like minus 35% drop in these main indices. Then there was the first rebound, the recovery phase, okay? Uh, and then the plateau, and then the surge, the upsurge, I would say 10, 15% from the last day of October to uh, last Friday. Okay. So now as a first result, we want to highlight here what is the liquidity and how the liquidity split in Europe, because we know that fragmentation differs in the US from Europe. So it's good to just situate where, what it looks like and how things evolved during this crisis. The first uh, here highlight. So what we represented here is different form of equity trading. First here in blue, you've got the lit trading, okay? The lit trading, so either on the primary venues or the MTS, okay? Then you've got dark trading in white, of book, OTC, the SI, okay, and the periodic auctions, which is a smaller uh, fraction. Okay, so what we observe more or less is that like lit market represents some somehow like 40%, 45% of the global liquidity uh, and equities. This uh, fraction tend to increase during the crisis uh, slightly. We we'll study this in depth, but there was uh, an increase in li uh, liquidity here. And at the same time, we saw a decline in other uh, liquidity. For example, well, OTC tend to be uh, smaller in this in this period, uh, in this period, as as you can see. So that is just to give you an overall uh, landscape uh, of what happened during the specific crisis. 
Then in terms of volumes, just to give you like some main highlights, in terms of volume, like what was traded, uh, what was traded. So here we represent uh, two things. We represent here the value in, your, for example, your next stocks month by month uh, that was traded, okay? So it is in, in turnover. And you will see this large increase during February and March where the worst of the crisis took place with the strongest market drop. Then the second phase, and uh, here an increase at the end of the recovery, the first rebound in June, and then the summer, which was uh, experienced lighter volumes. So you see that greater volumes as expected coincided with uh, the greatest volatility and the greatest uh, market drop. We also represent here in this chart in dotted blue line, the market share. What we call the market share is uh, here the the fraction of the lead trading that takes place at your annex on the regulated market, the primary market, versus what happened on MTFs, so competi competitors or other venues. And here we see that we represent in Europe, this is a case for most European countries, the market is much less fragmented as it is in the US because regulated markets represent more or less 70% of the liquidity. This, uh, this market share was relatively stable uh, to over uh, 2020. Okay, just uh, first facts. Okay, so this is just to set the stage. Now we're going to look at, uh, with more detail, at what is happening in the order book. So first here, uh, the attendees are, I get for some students who wouldn't know the terminology, what we will call depth of the order book, which will be the average available sizes at the best bid and the best ask. We call it depth or available sizes on the first limit. And then necessarily the bid has spread the difference between the best ask and the best bid. Okay, so first here we rep represent here on the most liquid stocks of your next, most 120 most liquid stocks where liquidity providers have like special uh, scheme to provide liquidity. And we look at the bid ask spreads, so daily bid ask spreads over this uh, 2020 period. So what do we observe? First, I mean, it was not surprising for anyone who's experience with market uh, market micro, micro structure is that during the strong drop bid ask spreads widen uh, enormously from i would say six to almost 24 bips in just one month okay so this was extremely extreme extreme widening and then when market here during the second phase uh, here during the, the first rebound spreads tightened again not fully, but tightened again when market recovered. During the plateau phase here, uh, spreads were more or less uh, stable until now. So this uh, here widening is not surprising because as, uh, we, we, as we know in market, as market practitioners, spreads are strongly related to volatility as spreads represent more or less, it is the classical economic interpretation, more or less the gain from a theoretical market maker and when the volatility is greater, the risk for the passive market maker is greater. And then for a greater risk, you want to be compensated by a greater reward. That's why usually uh, it is uh, acknowledged that spread would widen when volatility increases. To put this in perspective, I've extracted here from uh, my uh, 2020 MOOC, here an example of the, the same stocks uh, from 27, okay, 2007, to 2018, what happened? Okay, so here we look at the great financial crisis at the end of 2008, September to uh, September 2008, and here we see that during the great financial crisis, bid ask spreads here, for example, on large caps, increased from seven to 13 bids. Okay, so they doubled uh, here during this great widening, and then during past crisis in 2010, 2011, which were large European crisis specifically for debt and the Greek debt crisis where the Euro was really in uh, trouble. Uh, here you have also some smaller widenings, okay, with volatility. If you were to compare here current value during the worst of the drop, the market drop here, these are displayed by uh, my pointer here with looking at the orange uh, dot, the light blue or the mid blue, we can see that spreads widened, not as much as during the worst of the great financial crisis, but not far from these levels, okay? This is also the case for 
uh, large caps, mid cap, as well as small caps. So it wasn't as extreme, but it was somehow uh, not too far. Then if we want to study a little more precisely this uh, relationship. Well, uh, the small question for Sorry, you. Sasha. Um, when you compute beta spread, so this is a question from the audience, uh, do you take it uh, 15 minutes before the close or an average throughout the day or how do you okay. do it? Okay, so there are several computations uh, for beta spreads. Here we do it's time weighted over uh, the continuous market. One simpler way of doing it is just to measure the beta spreads when uh, there are trades, but we do it, it's an intraday time averaged beta spreads. Okay, likewise here in this chart where in chart 15, where we represent the intraday volatility. So here we take an estimator for the intraday volatility with a Garman class estimate, estimate, and we compute here on average, the average of the daily intraday daily volatility for the 120 stocks uh, here for these stocks, and also here on a daily basis. And we plot here the corresponding BDASK spread. So as you see here in this uh, example, uh, over 2020, when intraday volatility increased, uh, spreads, daily spreads increased as well uh, in a almost linear relationship. And you see that now, I mean, uh, here at the end of uh, October, at least where we were here, the, or the, the red dot, we're almost, we've almost reverted as far as the beginning of the year, uh, but not as much. And this is normal because in fact, what happens is that the volatility, the intraday volatility is still way higher than prior to the crisis. So you see what is interesting is that this extreme relationship, this extreme uh, widening of spread is uh, makes sense and is related to intraday volatility. And this relationship is not so much distorted. It is almost linear, even when uh, the volatility was extreme. So it shows a good functioning of the market and that uh, long-term relationship still uh, has uh, the steady relationships. So Paul, we have another technical question related to no? the bid ask spread widening. Do, do you, um, how do you average these things? Is it vol volume weighted in any way or, or do you sort of- uh, for ah, here, here we do it for like 120 stocks. Okay, so as we just displayed how we do it stock by stock on, over a day, for example, then we have read it over like the 120 stocks. We do likewise for volatility. So we have this kind of measure here to represent what is happening on average on these 120 stocks to see over time, on these stocks, what happens when volatility, the average volatility increases, and at the same time, do we observe a widening in the uh, beta spread? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is what happened over 2020. Now, if we step back and we look in this example from uh, our MOOC again, what happens over here, looking at the past 10 years from 2007 to 2018? Okay, here we distinguish large cap in uh, dark blue, mid cap in gray, and small caps in orange. If you represent the volatility per trade, so here it's a, a little different because he wanted to get a better result. So we adjust it this way. So volatility per trade, meaning in the volatility of each trade, okay, of each uh, price movement between each trade, and then the bid ask spread. And you will see again, if you were to study one, for example, one dot for an average large cap, mid cap, small caps, over time, when volatility increases, beta spreads also increase. So this is a very strong uh, result. It is very well in theory, but it also holds true in reality, looking at past 20 years of data, like looking at 2020. Okay, it's a strong result. That's really is true in practice. Okay, for this one. Okay, so, so now, each, sorry, each, Sasha. Point is a day or it, it, it's, it's point is a day. Uh, in the MOOC, I distinguish two things because you can do it either cross-sectionally at a, at a given day, what happens uh, when stock changes, or here looking at a given day over a sample of uh, comparable stocks, what happens when things change over another day where you compute another average volatility and an average spread. Okay. Now let's move on to the available depth. So the available depth is a little less well known than the beta spread, but it also characterizes 
the liquidity. Why is that the case? Because when there is fewer available sizes uh, here on the first limit, there is less liquidity that is uh, tradable, okay? And it characterizes uh, here a lack of liquidity. So uh, here, what happens is that prior to the crisis, on average, on these uh, 120 most liquid stocks in Europe, uh, that is Euronext stocks, you had an average of 40,000K euros available on the first limit, meaning that you could trade actually 40,000K, okay, with, with just emptying the first limit, not needing to empty further limits, okay? That was the case prior to the crisis with a low volatility environment. Then during the first drop, what happened is that suddenly, coincidentally with the widening on spreads, here you saw a very strong decline, a, a very strong decline in the available sizes. Okay, these available sizes dropped from forty thousand to almost fifteen thousand. Okay, so this huge drop, while in fact you had a great turnover. So meaning you had a lot of turnover. In part, the market was considered as very liquid. Okay, because a lot of turnover took place, but spreads widened and available sizes dropped severely. During the market rebound, here, uh, the available sizes increased from 15,000 back to 20, but we were still halfway from 40. And uh, they stable, they remained more or less stable and did not revert to the pre-crisis level. So again, this raises questions, say, why is this the case? How can we explain this? So we can explain this easily, in market microstructure, as well by the behavior of the one that is uh, here providing liquidity and being the market maker. So what is the problem of the market maker? The problem of the market maker is that by displaying some quotes here at the first limit, the market maker is incurring risk, okay? And the greater the volatility, the greater the risk for a given uh, trade size that will be posted on the first limit. So what happens if a market maker wants to control the risk and uh, manage with a constant uh, risk exposure when volatility increase to, in fact, uh, keep this risk exposure constant, you have to reduce the quantity you post on the first limit. And that is the main explanation why we see this phenomenon. And it is often and always the case, as we will see later, that when volatility increases, in order not to have an overexposure in risk, market maker will reduce the size they post on the first limit. So, and in results in uh, showing uh, smaller available sizes on the first limit. So this is what, we, what happened over 2020. Now, if we look at, again, in a different representation, linking here on the X axis, the intraday volatility computed just as we did uh, on the first line, uh, the pre previous example on, uh, for example, when we related volatility with uh, BIDASK spread, here we do the same computation. Uh, here on the y axis, we display the first limit size, uh, the first limit size. And what you observe is that when volatility increases, you get this kind of hyperbolic shape, which here induces a decline in the first limit sizes according to a, a greater uh, intraday volatility. So this relationship is not linear, it's not perfect, but you still have an idea of how things uh, are related between the first limit sizes and volatility. During the worst of the crisis, when volatility, intraday volatility was extreme, around 100, you see that you had almost the 14, the 15K that we described, and then we reverted almost uh, halfway. Okay, so this is what we saw over 2020 uh, for this relationship. Now, if we step back and want to study this relationship over a longer uh, term period, let's look at the MOOC example. And in the MOOC example, we did it over 10 years, 2007 to 2018. Here we represented things more specifically. So it's the volatility per trade that really is the quantity that is uh, for me, the, that explains the most the risk of the market maker because it is at each trade by how much the market will change at each, each trade. So if you plot on the X axis, the volatility per trade, on the Y axis, if you want to make things comparable, you don't have to compare euros. It's better to, comp to measure average trade size, uh, the depth in average trade size, meaning how many potential trades will be, will be uh, present on the best limits. 
and it's measured in, so in a fat stress test so that you can normalize different stocks using the same metric. And what you see is a nice, quite nice relationship because over time, when volatility increases, uh, you have decline in uh, the first limit sizes that is also observable on a long-term uh, historical uh, database. So what we can say is that the reduction in available sizes on the first limit is completely uh, here consistent with long-term properties. And the fact that we've reverted halfway is just because in fact volatility is still way higher than it was prior uh, to uh, the crisis, meaning early uh, 2020. So that is for this one. Now, if we want to relate uh, here both variables together, the bid ask spread and the first limit size, here you've got also a nice relationship. On average, uh, here uh, the bid ask spreads and the first limit size have this kind of hyperbolic uh, shape, meaning that for a larger uh, here over time, when you have a larger uh, bid ask spread, usually for the same stocks, you will have a smaller uh, available size on the first limit. So this is a property that holds true again uh, for the reason that we explained is that volatility will create a larger bid ask spread and a tighter, a smaller first limit size. So because of this uh, relationship with volatility, we have this uh, negative relationship between the first limit sizes and the bid ask spread. It is also something that you observe looking at past uh, 10 years from 2007 to 2018 here, where we have exactly the same phenomenon when there is here a, a larger uh, bid ask spread, usually it coincides with a tighter, uh, with a here thinner first limit size. Here in this property, what is also nice that we can explain with this normalization, uh, because we are in this chart here also, is that when you express the spreads here in tick, uh, in tick size, you divide the spread by the tick size, you will see that, of course, since the spread can never be tighter than one tick, when the spread is uh, here constrained by the tick size, here, uh, the first limit size increases a lot as uh, here represented uh, by these examples, since in order to compete, market maker cannot increase, I mean, tighten the bid spread, but they have no choice than to adding more limit on the uh, existing limits. That's why the uh, available limits are greater when uh, stocks have uh, a bid spread that is constrained on the tick. Okay, it means that uh, this relationship again, that we observed in 2020 uh, here makes sense and is consistent with long-term properties that we can observe over uh, the past uh, 10 years. Okay, so that is a, a roughly like a summary uh, for, for this part, that uh, whatever the market capitalization of the stocks, when volatility increases over time, bid ask spreads also widen. What we can also observe is that uh, the order book <laughs> depth clearly decreases with increasing volatility uh, as market maker, makers <laughs> reduce the risk. Okay, and during the COVID crisis, so no spectacular or here phenomenon took place. This, if you were uh, controlling for the uh, volatility increase, things were normal. And here I must just say a word. Uh, we had a lot of debate during the worst of the crisis with regulators, different European regulators. Some of them even saying that should we, shouldn't we close the market? Is the market behaving properly? Are market makers doing their job? And it shows that yes, the market was behaving as normal due to the crisis and uh, the functioning was not here modified that much. Spreads widening were consistent with uh, volatility increases. Okay, so now in the second part of the presentation, we are going to discuss flows, meaning uh, we're not just going to look at the other book, but think how did market participants behaved and who are our market participants? Okay, so here what we have, which is uh, great in Europe because of our regulators. Sometimes we complain a lot about our regulators, but sometimes it's good on the data side because sometimes regulators require that data should be extremely carefully labeled. And this is the case. So we know uh, extremely precisely in all European exchanges, if we are trading with an agency flow, meaning for a broker, trading on behalf of another client. We know if it's a prop desk flow, we know if it's a liquidity provider or retail flow, we know 
this with no ambiguity. So this is what we're going to study. Okay, so first, well, okay, we've seen this graph just to recap in four phases because we will distinguish the drop, the first rebound, the plateau, and the second rebound. And we will review in each of these phases how market participants behaved. So first, here, uh, here we are going to look at market shares. Okay, so here first, it is something that was uh, considered as a proprietary information not so long ago. So not a, it's not available everywhere. You can't find it everywhere, this kind of chart. So here you represent who is trading our stocks. I mean, <laughs> roughly with the market share of each of the participants. So what we see before describing the changes during each of the phase, what we see here is that uh, you have like the largest category is prop desk and liquidity providers. When we've aggregated here prop desk in light, light blue, prop desk and the liquidity provider that represents like two thirds of uh, the liquidity here, most of them, I won't say exactly which part, but most of them come from liquidity providers. Liquidity providers are specialized uh, trading firms that in order to benefit from uh, here spatial fees have to fulfill requirements, meaning they have to be at the first limit for a given size for some uh, being at the best, uh, best limit and providing liquidity to benefit from a fee. So we can flag them uh, very clearly. Okay, these are usually the lowest latency, the best infrastructure, and they are the most well-known uh, proprietary trading firms. So you see, these are the first category. Then come the global brokers. So the global brokers are the global brokers, uh, like uh, the largest primary brokers, most of them being exclusively, almost exclusively large US brokers. Okay, they represent, I would say, like 25% of our flows. Then come the regional brokers. So the regional brokers are the non global brokers, meaning either European based or Asian based uh, brokers that are not in this global category. They represent a third of uh, global brokers. And what is interesting is that their clients are not usually the largest hedge funds, meaning that their flows is mostly made of directional players, meaning fundamental fund managers that are based locally in Europe. So they have a very different trading profile as, for example, what the profile you will observe if you look at global brokers. Then, and the last one, is the retail, uh, the retail market. Okay, the retail market, we can identify them very clearly because they've got different fee scheme, different, uh, dif uh, different behavior, and they more or less represent like 6% in, uh, in our market, uh, and uh, we can identify them very clearly. Okay, so this is the broader, broad picture. Now, <laughs> let's look at what is happening, what has happened during each of these phases. So first, during the drop. So during the drop, Interestingly enough, you had an increase in uh, liquidity providers. The market share rose here, as you can see, prior to the drop, it was, I would say around 62%. It rose until 66%, meaning that despite criticism, when the market was in trouble times, when volatility increased enormously, market makers were there, not only were they present, but the market share increased in comparison to other times, okay? So they fulfilled their mission, they would not, <laughs> they did not retract when times were difficult. So it's important to have this in mind and we show this specifically to regulators showing they were doing their job. Okay, while they have a bad reputation and everyone blames HFTs, without them, the market wouldn't have behaved this way, this well. Then you see the global, global brokers in mid blue, Global brokers were tended to be less present during these troubled times, okay, and uh, they were compensated by a uh, liquidity provider. During the recovery, what happened is was a little uh, surprising for many participants, also for us, I must say, is that we had the rise of the retail. The retail investors with were in fact really like more and more present, and their market share increased as uh, it has never increased in the past. It can seem small here, but uh, rising from six to eight, four to six percent is a lot in relative terms, meaning that retail brokers observed many kind of new accounts uh, that people wanted to buy stocks and never did before. So there was a lot of uh, participation from uh, retail flows uh, that we can invest we'll see before, while uh, liquidity providers were less uh, present in this recovery phase. 
the plateau phase, we haven't seen a lot of things. And then we can what we can see in the second rebound, the recent rebound that we just saw recently, you have, I would say, global participants who are more present. And you will see that uh, they were the ones that were the quickest to buy the market uh, there recently, early uh, November. So this is the first idea of how market shares distorted in 2020. Again, this might be very different in the US, but it's kind of European view of uh, the market. So the uh, first things, uh, if you want to look at the, the flows, the most well-known metric is uh, the trading imbalance. So the trading imbalance, it represents the buys minus the sales divided by the total buy plus sell. If it's 100% plus, it means that you just had buys. If you minus 100%, you just had the sales. And so it's an idea here how uh, trading imbalances evolved over uh, the, uh, the 2020. Okay, so perhaps we go here. It's a representation, a sliding representation, but as I think I should uh, perhaps be a little quicker. So I just pass here on this view with an where you can see exactly a bar chart when you can see every period. So we distinguish these four periods. So what is interesting is that during the market drop, here we represent the trading imbalance of each of the participants with this uh, kind of bar chart, while here with the dotted line, we represent the coinciding market performance, both in close to close and the intraday chain performance for, we'll get into this a little later. So what we can see is that interestingly, despite the strong market drop, we can see that regional brokers were buyers, okay? More buying than selling. Retail brokers were really buying with a very strong uh, trading imbalance, meaning that retail investors, despite their small size, were really, really interested in buying and were contrarian uh, during this strong drop. Okay, while global brokers were not that by, by buying the market, and prop desk were rather sellers. Okay, this was uh, something interesting. In the second phase, the rebound, it was uh, you also had like retail brokers that were strongly buying the market. Okay. And during the last phase, uh, the recovery, the strong recovery, here you had some regional brokers that were buyers, retail were still sellers, and prop desk were buyers. So this is a first view of uh, trading imbalance by market participants during each of uh, these uh, phases. Okay, so what you can see here uh, at first sight is that uh, prop desk and liquidity providers provided liquidity during the, the largest market drop, okay? During the rebound, uh, the, the retail uh, market share rose quickly. And that's uh, during the first drop, <laughs> you can see that retail flows were still extremely buyer and were, uh, in fact, uh, balancing the market against other participants that were uh, rather heavily sellers. Okay, just for this part. Now we are going to study something a little more complex, but not too complex. It is something, how can we explain the performance with the trading imbalances, okay? So it's something interesting because theoretically we feel that when you have more buyers, when you have a lot of buyers, uh, stocks would have to tend to perform or underperform when there are more sellers. Since also the market is completely balanced because you've got as many buyers as sellers in, uh, for example, I, in, the, in the market because it is the case, uh, it is always the case. So we will study the correlation between the trading imbalance and the performance. Okay, something we are uh, going to study. We'll study it either using close to close performance or looking just at the intraday performance, showing that looking at intraday performance, we can explain more precisely the performance because the performance during the day is more strongly linked to the actual trading where the overnight performance is not attributable to uh, a trade that only takes place in the continuous phase. So this is the first two, uh, questions we're going to raise. And then we have also here, we will address another question, and this will be the last one, which is called aggressive trading imbalance. Because as an exchange, we can not only distinguish the flows, meaning the buys and the sales, but we can also distinguish the aggressive buys, meaning the buys that took place at the ask, or the sales that took place at the bid. And these aggressive flows are more likely to impact uh, stocks as we will see. So we will also study uh, this uh, correlation between the aggressive trading imbalance and the performance also, and with the trading imbalance and the performance.
So these are the metrics that we can we see here. And sorry, well, couple new Dasha. questions. Um, we have a couple new questions. The the first one is, um, and I think it was referring to the previous slide. Uh, does this imply that retail brokers were generally buying when shares were dropping in price in the first phase? Alors here, yes, it is exactly what we see because you see that the regional brokers here in mid green, uh, the trading imbalance was uh, around plus 12% during the severe drop where the market dropped by, I would say 30% looking at the right hand scale, okay, axis. Uh, so yes, exactly. Retail brokers were heavily buying during this phase, yes. And during the market drop. And we have another question related to slide 26, um, which is, do you have a theory why the market share change of global brokers is so negatively correlated to the prop market share? So ah, time yeah. the drop right. global, there's a- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the theory, it's not a <laughs> theory, it's just pure math. It's then since the sum of the all, all, all of them equals to 100%, and since they are the two largest uh, in numbers, yes, when one varies, the other is more likely to absorb it. Uh, that would be the mathematical, the trivial explanation. And then, yes, it, it is a bit, I would say that uh, the regional brokers are more steady uh, because their behavior is less affected by very aggressive participants. Uh, so that is one thing. So since it varies a little less as well as the retail, then the two potential uh, drivers of these variations are, uh, yes, the global brokers and uh, the liquidity providers. I think someone raised a hand or something. Is there another question, Sasha? Uh, for, not for now. Okay, good. So uh, we've been there. So we are just explaining these met metrics. And now we look at the results. Okay, so there we are looking at uh, here, for example, weekly performances. And we look, uh, let's take, for example, at uh, here on the left hand side and here on this, uh, just these four bars here. So this is the correlation between the trading imbalance, okay, here for each participant, let's say the global broker trading imbalance and the performance of a stock, for example, over a weekly period uh, here. So what we observe here is that on average, there is a positive correlation between the trading imbalance of uh, the global brokers and the performance of the stocks, the performance of the stock. So it is positive, meaning that on average, since these global brokers represent a large fraction at like 24% of our flows, when they are buying, tends that I would explain it as a market impact, but it tends to show, it tends to coincide with an outperformance of uh, the stocks in with a 15% correlation. This is less the case for regional brokers as they would represent a fewer, a smaller fraction of the flow. And it is even less, and this uh, correlation is negative for retail brokers. So here we see that, and it is often a phenomenon that we always see retail brokers, at least in Europe, have a negative correlation with the performance, meaning that not, they don't, it is not the case that they don't impact the market, but in fact, that they have a contrarian views. It's either by, posting limit orders that, for example, have uh, attractive limit orders. And when the stock hits this level, they find themselves buying the market, meaning that it will be buyer when the stocks dropped, for example. Okay, is it, this is a behavior that is extremely common for retail flows. So this is something we see. And if you look at the next four bars, here we study the correlation, but not with the standard trading imbalance, but with the aggressive imbalance. And then you see stronger results. The correlation here is not like we would say 12, but it was raised to uh, 16 or 18, okay? Meaning that you have a better explanation of the performance that is coming from the aggressive flows because the aggressive flows are more likely to impact uh, stock uh, performances, as you can see uh, clearly uh, for all participants, unless for uh, retail brokers because they don't impact, but in fact, they find themselves buying the stock when the stock drops because of their behavior of uh, posted uh, limit orders. So this is for the close to close performance, but you have even a better explanation if you look at intraday uh, performance, because then the correlation is uh, more tighter, is tighter and greater, because then you don't, you're not, the performance is not polluted by uh, periods that happen overnight where in fact, uh, trades have no impact. 
So for example, if you look at the right hand side here on again, uh, global brokers, the correlation with, if you look at the correlation of their aggressive trading imbalance with the stock's outperformance here, which is almost like uh, 24%, which is quite large, which is quite large. And that explains, shows that they agree uh, quite well with, in fact, uh, stock's performance. It is less the case for uh, regional brokers, and you still have this negative uh, correlation for retail, uh, for retail brokers. So it's interesting to have this view. And by the way, this view is also quite telling because out of this, as us as exchange, we make and build product uh, for hedge funds where we aggregate daily all these kind of signals with many, many, many metrics to see how are the most likely flows going to be stock by stock over the next day. Paul, so I have a question about trading imbalance and how it's measured. I, I was wondering whether you could give a sort of an intuition for, you know, if these correlations are negative, does it for okay. the retail, does it mean that they're losing money or, you know, it, does ah. it, uh, or, or, I see, I see. Or, or we can't say that for sure. I see. I, it's, it's, I mean, if it was positive, you can either say that uh, you're, you're trend following or that you are creating a market impact if you have got a positive correlation, okay? If you've got a negative correlation, it is more that you will find that you are contrarian, meaning that when you find a stock and you say, okay, I would buy a stock if, it, if this stock drops by 5%, then if there is a 5% drop, you will find yourself buying this stock because you find, wow, it has now an attractive level. And because they have such kind of behavior saying this is an opportunity when they see a drop, Okay, that's why, uh, that's why we see this negative correlation. It is not a causality, it's just a correlation. And to me, it is uh, caused and it's created by their behavior, meaning that when they see attractive price compared to historical anchor level that they've seen, they think it is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Likewise, they would sell a stock that is usually more expensive than what they see, they consider as uh, they're used to. And so that's why they find themselves more selling stocks that are, have outperformed. But so if I'm buying during a big drop, I would see a very large negative correlation. And if at the close, at the end of the day, the price is lower than when I bought it, that would be an example of a, a strong yes. negative correlation. Or you bought it on the days where the stocks dropped, for example. Okay. That would be an example. Okay, so it's nice to see this. And now if you look at the trading, aggressive trading imbalance, because it's a kind of thing, even, even if this metric is less well known as the trading imbalance, the aggressive trading imbalance is more telling. And here, if you look at each of these phases, again, you will see that regional, what is interesting is that regional brokers were aggressively buying the market, okay, during the drop, while global brokers were less inclined to do so. Retail brokers were also, um, retail brokers were heavily buying the market while uh, prop desk were aggressively selling the market. Because here, being a buyer or a seller is not the same thing when you're a patient buyer or a patient seller or an impatient one. Because the, when you're really impatient, it is when you impact the market. And it's also most likely, it is where you have uh, here, for example, a strong trading signal that even if you want to pay for a higher price, you don't mind doing so because you have greater expectations. So it is also telling to disentangle and to here disentangle these two imbalances between the passive one or the standard one and the aggressive one. And uh, again, in the market rebound, in the here, <clears throat> the strong market rebound that we saw, the last one, the aggressive, if you just look at the aggressive participants, you see that this last rebound was mostly uh, fueled by either global brokers I mean, okay, global brokers or prop desk, while in fact retail were uh, slightly cautious uh, for their aggressive flows during the last period in uh, November. Okay, then uh, in these uh, few more slides, I represent sector by sector what is what has happened during each of these uh, phases. Okay, so you can see uh, the drop and the rebound. Okay, I won't go there. Uh, sector by sector, but I think it's also interesting if you want to look at this and understand better how uh, participants behaved. Um, okay, so what we can say here is that, uh, I think to step back a little is that if you study correlation, the one that cause or really have a co positive correlation with uh, 
stock performance is uh, by far global brokers. This correlation will be stronger if you look at intraday chain performance in comparison to close to close, and even stronger if you study like the aggressive trading imbalance instead of the simple uh, trading imbalance. You will also find that retail flows, at least in Europe, are heavily contrarian. And it's not something that is that well known because some people would <laughs> bet when they haven't seen the data that retail investors would tend to be trend followers. They are not in Europe or they don't behave like this with this metric. Uh, that is also interesting. And for us as an exchange, just in order to, I would say, almost to, to conclude, it's important that we have and we maintain the diversity of uh, trading participants. Because in fact, it is without the heterogeneity of all these participants, the market will not be as resilient as it is, as balanced as it is. And uh, in fact, everyone fulfills uh, its role. And you see that during this strong drop, uh, liquidity providers took the lead and uh, had a greater market share. You see that retail also were important in uh, aggressively buying the market. So it is a balance that we have to manage uh, as uh, here market uh, here managers. And when we run an extent, it is something that is really uh, important to have in mind. Okay, so for me, I would be happy if you have questions because we've got, uh, I've got 10 minutes. And uh, if you had more questions, you can always ask us or Sasha and get back to me and I will be sure to answer each of them. So I'm happy to pass the floor to Sasha. Yeah. So there are a few questions um, that are remaining in the Q&A. Um, one is interesting. So it's, have you ever thought of using sentiment data from let's say news headlines to explain the retail actions? Or do you have an explanation for their strong contrarian behavior? Well, I must say I haven't, uh, unless for some specific like earnings uh, announcements, for example, where I studied things uh, clearly, uh, deeply, uh, I haven't connected uh, such a thing. Uh, I don't really know, I haven't studied uh, the behavior of, uh, apart from this, because I study what really puzzles me. And uh, I think it's fascinating. It's the connection between the flow and the performance or the next performance, next day performance or the next uh, behavior, not going back to the root cause of why this behavior. So I must say, I thought that this would be perhaps more for uh, Sasha, for academics. I haven't studied this. Uh, it's not so much my, my thing, but no, sorry, I, I haven't uh, done it. Yeah. Uh, I, we have another question, which is, um, do you have a view on the role of the algo algorithms or algos uh, to the behavior of the different broker types? Okay, Alors, here, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, what is really, when you look at things, uh, and we do, and we even have products on this, on daily things, uh, it's quite different looking at global brokers or regional brokers for one reason is that global brokers tend to attract many, many like uh, hedge funds because they tend to trade with the prime brokers and that's uh, heavily represented in these flows. Whereas in contrast, local brokers have almost no, or almost no very large hedge fund or no quant funds. So they are quite different. So yes, I can say that this typology of flows are quite different and regional flows are way more fundamental way more fundamental and quite different. And the correlation between these two flows uh, is not great at all. And it's really interesting to have some kind of uh, very different uh, behaviors between two brokers types. When uh, the question is specifically, the question is asking for the algorithms that uh, lead the execution, I would say that there is not such a big difference because in the uh, algorithmic world, I would say like three main types of algos dominate all the world, which is the the VWAP, the volume, the implementation shortfall. With these three types of algos, you've got almost everything. And global original brokers have this kind of algos. So it's not so much the type of the execution, but the nature of the underlying execution. I would say that distinguish. If it's, for example, a quantitative trade that's done by a quant fund, or if it's a fundamental trade by a, that, that differs mostly rather than the algorithm itself. Um, well, within broker, then of course, uh, HFTs and equity providers have got completely different types of algorithms. Um, one, uh, another question that just came up. Um, can you comment on the direction of causality of the global broker flows? Is it the buying that is moving the stock prices up or are they buying when expecting a positive return? 
Alors, I think that uh, all of them, well, <laughs> I would have changed uh, the question, but I think the, all of all participants buy, I mean, <laughs> buy almost all of them would expect a greater return, Un unless economists would call it otherwise a non-informed flow, meaning that when they have to pay for uh, their car or whatever their expense and they, uh, they, uh, they sell stocks. But apart from these specific cases, when you buy, it's because you, you expect that it will be higher in, in, in the future. So, uh, so this, well, but for the causality, to answer the causality, I think you've got, it's hard to disentangle, honestly, <laughs> because it is one of the hardest <laughs> questions you can, uh, and most of the interesting question, it's hard to disentangle. We know that it's hard to disentangle between market impact and also buying and being uh, a momentum trader. I can't disentangle the two. The, the two. I would say perhaps uh, one thing that leans, I would lean toward like being slightly momentum oriented is that what is the case is that the, the order of magnitude of market impact is way smaller. Okay, so for example, if you have a large market impact by 20 bits, it's a large, a large market impact, meaning you've bought perhaps 2% of the ADV of the stock. Okay, it's perhaps it won't induce a large lot of correlation. Whereas if you have like a, a momentum buyer, you will introduce far more uh, correlation. So because of this argument, I would perhaps lean towards uh, the momentum uh, style versus the contrarian and the momentum for, for the global. But I am unsure. It's just I uh, haven't studied it specifically enough. OK, um, so we have a, an interesting question about the retail traders. So uh, retail traders typically have weaker hands to that of prop desks. So do you believe this correlation in trade imbalance could change if uh, performance goes negative again, like in March now that retail has ah. added so much to their, now that retail has added so much to their portfolio? Hello. What I, what I would say is that for sure, well, there is a structural difference in these uh, in these uh, buyers, okay, in these new participants, and we heard it uh, specifically, even if it's not your ex who is uh, like a, a broker themselves, but we heard that there was many creation of new participants. Some even, I'm not I'm not saying this uh, as a as a rumor, but some say that even because of confinement, some people that didn't couldn't bet on horses or whatsoever or on gaming. Took part and opened accounts. I think it doesn't reflect for the whole participation of the retail, but it's true that I would say newcomers were observed on the market. It is something that is said by every institution and all, uh, all, all retail brokers in Europe at least. So perhaps, and that's, that's probable, when someone is a newcomer, a bad experience or a first experience uh, is really uh, critical. And perhaps if uh, these participants were unhappy and I hope it won't be the case. Perhaps it will take them a while to get back in the market in contrast with participants that have years of experience and for them, a bad, bad market is something that they know how to deal with. So yes, I would be uh, perhaps uh, skeptical for these newcomers. I don't know how they would handle a bad performance and uh, what is a real experience of uh, risk and uh, knowledge. Yes, so that's why Brokers have to inform and the people have to inform these participants what well they are doing and the risk they are incurring. Um, okay, Paul. Well, uh, thanks for this very interesting talk that's provoked a lot of questions. Uh, okay, and, and again, uh, so yeah. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you all. And if you've got specific questions, either like technical questions, how things were computed, uh, in the MOOC it's quite explained, but uh, it's not a problem. I will be completely transparent because the, all these data, are, I mean, the MOOC data are public. Uh, if you've got other questions, get back to us, well answer, with pleasure. Yeah, so uh, Paul Besson, you can find him easily on LinkedIn and uh, he's active there. So, um, so feel free to follow up there. Paul, thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot, Sasha, and thank you all. Thanks, thanks, Rosel, and uh, have a great day in New York and <laughs> sleep well in in Europe. Okay. Bye bye. Bye 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 bye.